Hello, uh, my name is Nick Huntington Klein. Uh, I'm here today to talk about how to teach econometrics using R. It's gonna be basically an introduction to R uh, for people who teach econometrics. It's gonna be targeted mostly at people who are teaching econometrics, so it's not gonna really be really worried about other fields. It's also not gonna necessarily be about teaching you how to use R extensively, right? I wanna get you used to the basics, but the real key here is to sort of know, tell you what you need to know about how you can get comfortable enough with the language that you can start using it teaching an undergrad and also teach you some of the tips and tricks that are gonna come in handy, some of the packages, some of the tools, some of the functions, uh, especially in an undergrad econometrics curriculum. Uh, if you are watching this and you are not from the Cal State Fullerton uh, department, I've been pushing towards uh, a switch to R and we've sort of been moving in that direction. This, is, this video is intended to help uh, get people familiar with what the change might look like. Uh, it is hot in my house, it is late at night, the baby's asleep, I have a beer, uh, so let's get started. Share screen. Okay, so first of all, why R? Why is it a good idea to teach econometrics using R? Uh, well, there's a couple of reasons. So for one thing, you know, what is our what are alternatives here? So we could be teaching things in R. We could be teaching things with no software whatsoever, which is probably not a good idea because you got to use the software if you're going to do use any of this stuff. Uh, you could use Stata. You could use Python, Excel, MATLAB, uh, eViews, SPSS, everything. Right. So why R? So there's a couple of three things. So for one thing, it's a very general purpose. Right? It's not like eViews where it's really strongly based on time series. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it can apply to every single field of metrics. Uh, you can be doing time series. You can be doing uh, applied micro. You can be doing causal inference. You can be doing everything that you could possibly be doing. You can also do machine learning and data science. Uh, this is handy. Uh, so not only, I mean, even if you're not teaching machine learning or data science yourself, uh, you know, you don't know what your students are going to go and do with these skills that you're teaching. Right, uh, so you know, if they go and they are gonna in the future not do anything with any of this econometrics knowledge, well, that's one thing, you know, there's only so much you can do. Uh, but if they are gonna go in, into a job where they might be working with data, first of all, they're gonna be a lot more likely to use something like R than something like SPSS. Uh, you know, uh, maybe not as much as if they're, not as likely as they are to use Excel, but teaching econometrics in Excel, well, that has its own pros and cons anyway. Uh, but uh, it's gonna be, it's a lot more likely to get used on the job than a lot of the more academically oriented software packages that we might tend to use uh, in the past. Uh, and then also, um, uh, if, if they're gonna end up doing something with machine learning or data science, it's really hard to do that with a lot of the packages. You know, Stata has a couple of things. You can run a lasso in Stata, but really if they are learning Stata in school and then they're gonna go into a job where they have to do some sort of machine learning, they'll have to be not just learning those new tools, but also learning an entire new language the same time. We can avoid that by giving them a more applicable general purpose uh, and you know job ready uh, language. Second, it's a lot easier to jump from R to whatever they need to know in the future, right? If they're going from your class to another person's class who uh, uses different software or to a job that uses different kinds of software, it's a lot easier to make the jump from R to Stata than to jump from Stata to R. It's also a lot easier to jump from R to like Python, uh, which is a lot more, uh, you know, if you're thinking, well, hey, if I want them to really get a job ready language, well, I should teach them Python, right? That's, that's probably more popular in the job in, the, in careers uh, than R is. Well, yeah, probably it is. Uh, but uh, why not Python? Well, you could teach econometrics using Python. It's certainly possible. But I will say uh, it's a lot harder. Uh, so the way that I like to think about sort of the three big languages that economists use, uh, which would be Stata, R, Python, ignoring something like uh, Julia, maybe, uh, then, uh, you know, Stata is by economists, for economists, everything it does is geared towards economists. It does everything that economists want, it is very specifically an economics and sometimes other social science uh, package, uh, business, maybe. Um, uh, uh, R is by statisticians, for statisticians, so it does everything thinking about how statisticians do it. Python is by computer scientists, for computer scientists. So you can do econometrics in R, but it's, it's sort of not really built for that. Uh, and, you know, there's certainly things like econ tools, the package, or, you know, NumPy and all these sorts of packages that you can do econometrics in, but it's not built for that. A lot of the assumptions that you tend to make as an economist are being made in different ways because people are coming from different backgrounds. Uh, and so you have to work with it a lot more and squeeze it a lot more into shape to get it to do the econometrics thing that you want it to do. R is one step closer. It's not by economist for economists, but it's, you know, statistics is a lot closer to, econo to econometrics than computer science is. Uh, and so a lot of the assumptions that you might want to make, a lot of the tools that you would assume would be there and easy to use are there and easy to use in R in ways that they're not in Python and you might be expected to build things yourself. You know, as if you, if you, if you ever used like MATLAB in grad school because you needed to build your own estimators, yeah, you can do econometrics in MATLAB, certainly. People do do econometrics in MATLAB, but it sort of expects you to bring a lot more to it and do you really want to wrangle with undergrad students to do that or do you want to use a language where it's really going to be a lot more built 
for doing what they're doing, right? So uh, R is going to be do a lot, a lot better job of that. Not quite as good at Stata, but you know we talked about the, uh, the R versus Stata thing as well. Um, so uh, it's free. Uh, Stata and eViews and SPSS are not free. So once they leave academia, uh, once they graduate, what are they going to do with their skills? Well, maybe they go to a job that has Stata. That's great. But otherwise, if they're on their own, how are they going to possibly use that? So are they really going to pay for that really expensive license? If they're using R, they can just go do whatever they want, right? They, they now have the skills to do what they need. They have, that's a piece of power in their hand that, that is a piece of power that will be taken away if they're using this uh, expensive license software. Also, the visualization is really good. They can just make nice graphs. It's nice to look at nice looking graphs, you know. Uh, so, uh, they, you know, ggplot2 is a graphing uh, package uh, that's very good. It's very top of the line. Uh, and it's a lot easier to use than similarly good looking graphics packages in some other languages like say Python. So those are some reasons why I think R is good for teaching uh, the kind of metrics. Also, like I said, you can teach every single class in R, including time series. Uh, and actually you can synthesize your entire uh, curriculum into one link. Some resources. Uh, this is of course only gonna be a brief introduction to how, to how teaching econometrics in R works. Uh, so there are, of course, a lot of other resources that we can use. Uh, so one thing I would recommend looking at is the RStudio cheat sheets. Uh, so RStudio, it will, will go into in a little bit, uh, is a, a IDE. It's a, it's a piece of software through which you use R. And they, the company, RStudio, has put together a bunch of cheat sheets on different parts of R. So there are little one or two page PDFs that you can download, and they'll remind you of all different kinds of uh, uh, pieces of, uh, of functions and, and everything that you might need to know. Uh, about different areas. I actually have one of these pasted up on my office wall. Uh, my website, nickchk.com, on the econometrics page and the videos page, there's plenty of resources there uh, for different packages you can use to load data into R. I've got my video series introducing uh, you to R and going through the base, more of the basics of programming, which I'm not super going to do in this video. Uh, so if you're interested in that, go to those videos, uh, and those are targeted at the undergrad econometrics curriculum. So pretty much every tool that you might need for the undergrad econometrics cur curriculum, you should find a video on it there. I will say, by the way, all these links are on this video. You can't click them through the screen, but you can uh, get to these slides. Uh, so these slides are all stored here at um, rpubs.com uh, slash nickchk slash rteach2020. I'm not sure if you can see it with the zoom bar up there. You can probably see that. If not, there it is. rpubs.com slash nickchk slash rteach2020. Okay, so you can actually click these links. Uh, also, I will recommend the Swirl package. So Swirl package, uh, which you can also learn about more at swirlstats.com, uh, is a package in R that teaches you R. You can download these little classes and it will walk you through different aspects of the R programming language. So you can do something like, you know, I want to just want to learn the basics, basics, and it will say, okay, here's how you make a number. And it'll say, okay, here's how you make a number. And then it'll say, okay, now you make a number. And then you'll type in, okay, I'll make a number. Uh, and then it says, well, you did it right or wrong, and it'll guide you towards the right answer. These are very handy. There's all different sorts of classes that are available that you can download so you can get used to and in a, in a hands-on walking you through way uh, different parts of the R language. You could assign doing one of these things as homework. You can actually make your own. They have a package called Scrollify. It allows you to make your own uh, walkthroughs for different uh, types of things. So maybe you want to make that uh, some sort of homework assignment as well or just good training resources available. So uh, let's actually get into R. So I want to get you in the R mindset to think about how R handles things in ways that you know might not be familiar to you if you're coming from a different statistics package, especially something like let's say SPSS or maybe Stata. So in Stata, there's only or in R, there's only three things that you can. Do, okay, one is you can create or overwrite an object. And now an object in R is anything, everything and anything you can really think of as being an object. You can hold it in your hands, you can look it around, you can, and that's what an object is, right? And this could be a number, this could be a variable, this could be a data set. It could be a function. Uh, this could be a regression. Yeah, a regression is itself an object in R that you can manipulate just as you could, you know, a data set or something like that. Uh, so you can, you can create or overwrite an object. That's one thing you can do. The second thing you can do is you can manipulate objects using functions. R is a functional programming language. Everything that you do is you're going to basically be taking objects and you're going to be shoving them into functions and they're going to come out as different objects on the other side. So you say, okay, I'm going to create this number. This is a three right here. I'm going to take this three. I'm going to put it through my squaring function. And on the other end, I'm going to get a nine. That's going to be a new object, right? So I started with an object. I created that object. That's step number one. I manipulated that object by running it through a function. And the, function, and what I, the output that I got on the other side was a nine. That also is itself an object. The function itself was an object too. That squaring function was an object. And you can look at objects, right? So I started with a three, turn it into a nine. I want to actually look at that and say, hey, show me this object. And say, hey, it's a nine. 
oh, look, it's a number, right? Okay, so that's all you can do. Everything that you can do in R comes down to this. And if you can remember this and think about things in this way, think in, it'll make it a lot easier to understand how the syn why the syntax works like it does and how you can sort of work your way through putting together the correct uh, commands. Because you'll think, okay, what are the objects that I want to take here? I want to how what objects do I want to create? What do I want them to look like? How can I manipulate them uh, in order to get the objects that I want at the other end? Okay, so let's go over some of the basics. Uh, we're going to get familiar with R Studio. So first of all, R and R Studio are two different things. R is the language itself. You can download that at r-project.org. Uh, you can download it for your computer. Once you have that installed, you can then install R Studio. R Studio is rstudio. Dot com. It is sort of a window into R that makes it, in my opinion, a lot easier to use. You certainly not have to use it. A lot of people don't. Um, but I think it makes things so much easier that I, I can't imagine really using R uh, without it. So let's take a look at our studio here. So in our studio, uh, we have a number of different panes here. We have sort of four different areas of the screen. Over here on the left, we have our coding area. Uh, and over down here on the bottom left, we have our console. This is where the code is actually going to get run. Uh, up here on the top right, we have a couple of tabs. We have uh, the environment tab. Uh, that's going to be one that's basically going to show all the objects that we have loaded at any given time. We also have history, uh, which shows us all the code that we have run. Uh, and uh, down here on the bottom right, we have our sort of general purpose. Everything goes in here that doesn't have anywhere else to go pane. So we can have our, fi our file browser here. Any plots that we make are going to show up here. Uh, this tab shows us the packages that we have installed. And we can also use this to update all of our packages if we feel like. Uh, the very important help window, which I'll talk about in a second. And the viewer, which shows uh, some others. And basically, anything that's not a plot that it wants to show you. So some things about our studio. Uh, so first of all, up here in the top left, this code, you can see that we, have, we can have multiple code uh, tabs open at once, different R scripts. So you can see that R code is saved as .R. Uh, this is, of course, a code editor up here. It does all the things that you'd expect a code editor to do, including uh, auto-completion. R, R Studio has a very uh, strong, strong auto-complete uh, 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 technology. So you can, if you, if you don't really remember the full name of something, you can just start typing, and it will fill it in for you. So if I want to say, okay, well, I want to load a data set. What's the data function? If I do that, it will pop up, oh, data. Data, that's, that's the function that I want. And it will show you the full syntax uh, for that, th that function itself, which will help remind you how you can use uh, that function. Uh, and it will also, by the way, once you start writing it in, it will fill in the different values that it can take. It knows, hey, what can go in the data function? Well, it's all the data sets that I have access to right here. And so it's going to list all the data sets that I have. And so I can load in this, this data set, let's say. Uh, down here in the bottom left, we have our console. This will actually be where the code will actually run. I can type code directly into the console. I can say, hey, A is going to be 1 right there. Uh, you can see that code that I ran showed up on the history over here because I ran it. I just hit enter to run it. Uh, also, any code that I run up here in the uh, uh, code editor will run down there. Uh, and I can do that in two ways. So one thing I can do uh, is I can, or sorry, if I hover over a particular line, I hit control, enter, it will run that line. So I hit control and enter, it might be, I think it's command and enter on a Mac. Uh, and that line that I ran came, showed up down here in the, um, in the console and that ran the line of code, which of course put the scorecard data set into my environment, which is all the objects that I have loaded. Uh, also that A that I created, I said A was gonna be one, A can turn, turn out to be one up here in the environment. I can also uh, select a chunk of code and run it all at once. Uh, so I can uh, do, oops, forgot to load my libraries. One thing you, you always want to make sure to do in R is to load your libraries. Uh, you can also, by the way, uh, if you put some, uh, some curly braces around a bunch of code and you, you can just hit control enter once and it will run all those things. Okay, so all I'm doing up here, I'm running code. It's running down here in the console. I can run that code by hitting control enter. Uh, I've always, of course, saved my stuff, uh, all that sort of stuff you, you expect to be here. I don't need to explain all that to you. Okay, over here on the right, like I said, uh, we have our, uh, our objects stored in the environment. Uh, if I want to look closer at, like, let's say, a data set that I have here, I loaded this data set scorecard. I just click on it. Uh, it will show up up here over by the code. You can sort of see it in spreadsheet form. That's really handy. You always, of course, want to look at your data set firsthand. Makes it a lot easier to figure out. Um, yeah, any objects that I have. You can also see that there's this little blue uh, line or this blue triangle here. Uh, 
uh, if I click this, uh, this basically means that this object has smaller objects inside of it, sort of a box with objects inside of it. If I click this, it'll show me everything that's inside of this object. This is a data set, and so it's got variables inside of it. Uh, so when I click that little arrow, it shows me all the variables that are there, and it shows me the first couple of observations uh, that are in each of these uh, variables. All right, so those are our first three panes. Um, I can also, uh, over here down the bottom right, like I said, I can, I can uh, go to files if I want to load in a particular file. I might want to use this pane to sort of figure out where it is, uh, maybe set my working directory, uh, plots. Do a plot. We'll show up over here. Right, so in my plots thing, I can uh, export, I can save this plot. So if I click the export button, I can uh, click save as image or save as PDF, whatever it is. I can copy it to clipboard. If I'm doing a homework assignment, I'll copy it on my Word files. So I can copy to clipboard, paste it in there. Uh, I can also um, zoom in to get a bigger version of it before I do any of that stuff. Uh, and uh, yeah, those are the important things there. Uh, the viewer pane is where other stuff shows up. You don't generally need to worry about this too much. If it wants to show you something in the viewer pane, it'll pop up the viewer pane for you. Then there's the help. Help is right here. The help system is, of course, amazing. R has a reputation for not having very good help documentation, but I'm not sure how true it actually is. Uh, so let's take a look at a help file here. Um, so, uh, so we can get to the help files in a couple of ways, by the way. So I, on this help tab, uh, you'll notice, by the way, I can search there. There's a search bar. I can search for whatever I want. Uh, I can also go down here in the console and do help, whatever else. I want to help LM, which is the uh, OLS function, the regression function, linear model. Okay. So what do I have in the help files here? So uh, first of all, it's going to give me a description of the uh, function. Then it'll give me the syntax. It'll show me the arguments that it takes and the order that it takes them in. The order it takes them is, in, is important, by the way, because if you are giving them the, all the arguments that it wants in order, you don't need to help the name. Of the arguments. So uh, I don't need to say LM formula equals whatever, data equals whatever. If I just do the first argument's the formula, the second argument's the data, it'll know what those mean. Okay, so you might want to check the order of the arguments here. Uh, down here, it will tell me a description of each of those arguments that I can fill in. Hopefully, it should tell me the kind of things that it wants, the kind of object that it wants. Uh, so, you know, the data should be a data set, right? be a data frame, uh, as it says here all that sort of stuff. And especially this is important down here at the bottom. We have details. That's great. Read the details. But uh, there, down here at the very bottom, there are examples. Uh, examples showing you how to use uh, these, uh, these, uh, these, these functions, right? Which is important. I, I will usually skip straight here because it will tell me exactly what I need to know because I need to just have a good working example of something that works uh, so that I can, can work really well. Uh, so that's, that's a basic brief overview of our studio. There's a million tips and tricks with our studio. If you go to the R studio website, there's a cheat sheet with like, you know, a bunch of hotkeys. You can, you can do you, all sorts of magic uh, here, but I'm not going to get super into that. I will show you two other things. Uh, so one is how do you um, clear everything and start over? <laughs> so uh, you, it's good, good practice, by the way, for you to tell your students, hey, if you're writing a homework assignment, make sure that you clear everything and start over and then run all your code from the top to make sure that it works hard skill to get in the habit of, um, but you can clear all the objects out with this little broom icon. There's also a code that does this, but it's, it's needlessly arcane, so why? Uh, so I can just erase everything. Great, it's empty. I also might want to restart my RStudio session, uh, which I might want to do uh, because it's going to unload all packages that I have, so I can make sure that I'm remembering to include loading of packages in my data. If I go to session up here. Uh, I can do restart R, and that will restart everything all over fresh and new. Uh, one other thing is that if you go into session, you can set the working directory. So if you want your students to load in files or things like that from a work from, uh, from, from file, uh, they're going to need to set the working directory. They can, of course, do this in the code, uh, I would set a WD command, but it's a lot easier to just do it through the files. Uh, so one really handy one that I use all the time is to source file location. So if you have some code, and you save it to a folder, the folder that you are working in, then you can just say, hey, session, set working directory to source file location. It will set the working directory to wherever the active code that I'm looking at is saved to. Just handy. Uh, you can also uh, navigate wherever you want in the files pane and set the working directory to be file pane location, or you can just choose it directly with the choose directory option. Okay, those are the basics of our studio. Um, uh, yeah, let's get back to our slides here. Uh, oh, basic syntax of functions. So, Basically, most functions in R are structured in a very straightforward way, right? Uh, you know, you have the function name, then you have parentheses, then in, in the parentheses, you put all the arguments of the function. 
that's it. Uh, now, of course, this is different from function to function, exactly what those arguments are, what order they're in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in general, it's going to look something like this, uh, where whatever option it is, you set that equal to whatever you want it to be. Uh, so for example, let's say that I'm going to load that data set back in. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to run a regression. Okay. So I want a formula and I want a data set. Uh, so I'm just going to do LM. That's going to be my function. Of course, RStudio will pop up uh, this handy uh, reminder of what the syntax is. I want my formula to be, let me remind myself what the variable names are here. Uh, I'm going to regress, I don't know, earnings uh, median on count working, whatever. So I'm going to do earnings median on count working. Great. And notice, by the way, I, this is the first argument. This is formula. This is a formula object that I'm passing to it. Formulas are objects too. I didn't have to say formula because it's the first argument. Uh, because it's the first argument and I'm putting it first, it just knows that it's the formula. Then I want the data set. I could say data equals, let's say that I want to be scorecard. It doesn't know, by the way, that I want to run this regression in the scorecard data, even though it's the only data set that I have. I need to tell it which data set that I'm working on because it needs to know which object to look in for the data. There is no universal data set that is like the data set that it's working with at the time. It's not how R works. Uh, you can try to mash R to work that way, but it's not generally recommended. Uh, I want to skip. Let's let's uh, let's do another op option in here. Uh, let's say that uh, uh, I should have thought this ahead. Uh, let's set QR. What is QR? QR decomposition. Uh, sure. Let's set that to false. Right. So because I skipped a couple of options, right, I went from data and then I skipped all of these and I went just right straight to QR, I do need to specify the QR is the function that I'm using. Okay, and then it does that. Okay. That's the basic syntax of an R command. All right. So most of the time in econometrics, you are working with data. Uh, you're working with data sets. So let's talk about different kinds of data objects and, and variables that we're talking. So we're going to create some objects in R. Like I said, that's the first thing that R can do. You can create objects, you can manipulate objects with functions, uh, or you can display the objects that you get. Okay, so uh, let's create some objects. And now we're going to do this, by the way, with this little arrow right here. Uh, there are two ways to assign variables in R. Uh, there is the standard equal sign that you might typically see in most uh, uh, programming languages. And then there's this arrow, uh, which I quite like because it reminds you that what you're doing when you create an object is you're taking this and you're assigning it to that, right? You're not actually setting two things equal to each other. It doesn't make any sense, right? You, you know, if you say A equals one, well, in algebra terms, that means that you, you're solving for A and A is equal to one. And that's not really what's happening in a computer program. You say. You're taking this and you're assigning it to a value, right? You're taking that one, slamming it inside of that A. Uh, so uh, you can use an equal sign, but I think it, it, it pedagogically makes a lot more sense to use the little arrow. You can, by the way, also use the arrow in the other direction. It works if you want to be cute. Um, okay, now we're going to look at each object after we assign it by putting it on a line by itself. Putting an object on a line by itself is our way of saying to R, hey, I want to look at this object. So that third thing that I talked about, we can create objects, we can manipulate them with functions, we can look at them. Pretty much all the time with that third one, you can just do that by taking the name of the object and writing it on a line by itself. That's what that means in R, show me this object. And I put it above line by itself. Okay, so uh, there are um, a bunch of different objects, uh, data object types. Uh, so the main ones that we want to think about, uh, first of all, are numeric variables, standard, right? Uh, we take this one, we shove it inside a variable, we've called that numeric variable, uh, numeric dot var is a numeric type variable. It's a number, I can do all sorts of math operations on it. Uh, there's character variables, which are strings. Uh, there are factor variables, uh, which are uh, um, um, uh, discrete type variables. Uh, so, you know, uh, gender, uh, male, female, uh, you know, nationality, whatever, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, in, 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 in R, uh, these are stored as numbers uh, with labels on top of them, or they can be strings. And basically, so here I'm saying, uh, here's number one, and I'm gonna give that number one, the label, the word one. That's a factor variable. Uh, it's of course a space saving measure, and it also helps to create things like dummies uh, in regression. And there's, of course, logical variables, which are true or false. So good for dummies, good for binary variables, all that sort of good stuff. I want to look at the variable, uh, look at the, th the thing that I've created. I just need to put it on a line by itself. 
I put numeric var numeric dot var on a line by itself. It shows me the numeric dot var object that I've created, which of course was a one, shows me the one. Uh, I can convert between different types using as dot functions, uh, which can be handy. Uh, so if I want to take that numeric variable and turn it into a character variable, a string, all I got to do is wrap that object in the function as dot character, right? I'm taking that, num that, num that number, I'm running it through the turn into character function, and it gives me a character version of that object, which you can see here. Uh, by the way, one important thing to know uh, is that this function that I've run right here, as dot character of numeric variable, numeric dot var is still in there as a number, not a string, not a character. Because all I'm doing here is saying, take the numeric dot there, run it through the function to turn it into a character variable, and then show me the result. I'm not storing it anywhere, right? If I want to update an object, I have to use the little arrow again. So if I wanted to overwrite numeric dot var with the character version of itself, I, it would be as dot character of numeric var, and then I would do numeric dot var and then the little arrow of all this stuff, and it would update what I have, right? So if you want to save what you've done, and this is a constant thing, students forget this all the time, you got to remind them, if you want to save whatever changes you've made through a function, you got to store it in an object. Okay. So those are our data variable types. How do we build a vector out of that, right? How much is all about variables, which are variables or vectors. Uh, we can combine together different objects with the C function, uh, which is short for concatenate. So if I do C of one, 10, two, and three, I end up with a vector uh, that is one and then two, uh, 10 and then two and then three. Uh, I can uh, count count using the, the colon. So one colon 10 gives me all the numbers from one to 10. You can see right here. Uh, I can run this to the, fi the factor variable. So I've got C of one, one, two, two, one. That gives me a numeric vector of one, one, two, two, one. I'm gonna turn that into a factor with the factor function. And I'm gonna give those, the ones and the twos, the labels of the word one and the word two. So now it is a factor variable. Here's the data, one, one, two, two, one, one, all is words. And it's telling me the levels of the factor variable that are available, which are just one and two. Uh, I can take vectors and I can combine them with other vectors. So the concatenate function works on vectors as well. So I created this vector up here, which was one, 10, two, and three. I called it vector. I'm gonna concatenate that vector with a new vector, six and seven. So now I have one, 10, two, and three, and six and seven. Uh, we can look at vectors, of course. Uh, so I can uh, create vectors and I can, I can look at them through indexing, sort of standard indexing that you would use in any language. Uh, so if I want to look at the, uh, I'm going to take this vector, which is 11 through 20, okay? I want to look at the first, fifth, and ninth element of that vector, which of course are 11, 15, and 19. I can do that by taking another vector, 1, 5, and 9, and putting it in square brackets for that first vector that will tell me to, and the square brackets tell me I'm looking, I'm indexing here. I want to look for these, these values. Uh, so I want to look at the first, fifth, and ninth value. It's going to give me the first, fifth, and ninth value, which are 11, 15, and 19. Uh, instead of giving it index numbers, I can give it, give it trues and falses uh, to tell me which uh, elements I do or do not want to see. Uh, so what, what's going on here? So first, I start with a vector of logicals. So this is true, false, true, false. Then I'm using the rep function, which just tells me to repeat something. I'm repeating it five times. So I got true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. Okay, so that's 10 total elements. I give that to my vector. So it's going to give me the first element, true, not the second one, false. Yes, the third one, true, not the fourth one, false. And so on. So this, give me, this should give me all the odd elements of my vector, which are of course 11, 13, 15, 17, and 19. And there we have. All right. So we have these vectors. How are we going to turn them into data sets? So uh, in R, uh, pretty much every complex kind of object is a list. A list is a very general kind of like array where it's just an object with a bunch of objects in it. That's all that it is. Uh, so, you know, um, if I take a bunch of vectors and I throw them all together in one sort of big mega object, that mega object is going to be a list. It can be anything in there. It can be literally anything. Anytime you see any sort of uh, object with that little blue arrow that we talked about, where I click the blue arrow and you can see all the stuff that was inside of it, that's a list. Uh, pretty much every object created, every regression is a list of some sort, usually. Uh, it's a very flexible object with a bunch of stuff in it. Uh, if we have a list, we can pull out the, the elements of that list with double square brackets. Um, and the reason I'm talking about this is because in a second, I'm going to show you how data is an example of a list. So let's talk about lists for a second. So let's create a list. I'm going to take, um, create a list with a list function. What's going to be in this list? I'm going to put three objects in this list function. First one is uh, an object A, uh, and that is the numbers 1 through 10. Uh, the next is the object B, which is 11 through 20. And the next is the object C, which is just the word hello. 
Notice, by the way, I'm using the equal sign and not the arrow here. Uh, the arrow here works for assigning objects, but here I am uh, setting options of my list function, right? And options are always set with equals. I can only use the arrow to actually assign overall objects. Okay, so I've created this list. I want to look at that A object that I created, okay? I want to look at it. So what do I do to look at an object? I just put its name on a line all by itself. Uh, so here I'm taking my list and I'm pulling out the A object with the double brackets and I'm just giving the name of the object there. And here the object is named A, so I give it the, uh, the na A name object in quotes and it'll give me back the A object, which is the numbers one through 10. I could have also done in double brackets the number one and it would give me the first object of that list. Uh, I can also access elements of list using the dollar sign. So if I do my.list dollar sign C, it will give me the C element of that object. Notice, by the way, when I do the double brackets, I use quotes. Uh, when I use the dollar sign, I don't. Okay, so we have the idea of lists, which are objects with a bunch of objects in them. All that a data frame is, uh, a data set in R is, is a list uh, of a specific kind. And specifically, it is a list where all of the elements of that list uh, are vectors of the same length. It's a data frame. Uh, and you call it data frame, then it does all the things that data frames do. Data.frame is the sort of native R uh, treatment of a data set. Um, so uh, let's give an example here. So we're going to take that exact same stuff that I did before, where A was numbers from 1 to 10, B was 11 to 20, uh, and C was the word hello, except this time I'm going to make hello repeat 10 times. So it's the same length as the other vectors. So once I do this, I have a data set. My.df, my data set. Um, and I'm going to do a couple things. First, I'm going to add a new variable. So I mentioned that you could access elements of a list by either using the double brackets or the dollar sign. Uh, that doesn't necessarily only apply to objects that already exist. I can actually create new objects with that as well. So if I want to create a new element of my data set, let's say a new variable, I can do that with the dollar sign. I can say, hey, take my data from my data set and uh, find the, uh, the D element. There's no D element yet, but I'm going to assign it. I'm going to take this and I'm going to make it my D element. Well, what's going on here? You don't need to get into the specifics of the actual functions here, but what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm randomly sampling 10 trues and falses. So once I do that, I have my data set. I can look at the data. Uh, the head function says just to give me this first six elements so I don't fill up the screen. Uh, and this is my data set, right? It looks like a spreadsheet, as you'd expect, just like in any sort of statistics package. We have some sort of spreadsheet-like data in our data frame. Okay, we have our data sets. We're going to want to run stuff through functions. Uh, so a um, couple things. So one, most of the functions are what you'd expect. Mean takes the mean. Median takes the median. Uh, you know, quantile gives you quantiles. Uh, and of course, there's infinite other kinds of functions as well. A couple things to note specifically about R. I can't go through every single kind of function, uh, but just to give you some, some general overall things that you might run into as you are learning about some of the, some of the syntax, some of the commands. First of all, um, uh, you want to pay close attention to what kind of object it wants. So for example, the mean function can't take a data set, or if you want to take the mean of a particular variable, you can't just give it the whole data set. You got to give it the specific variable. So you need to take our data set, pull out the object, uh, or pull out the variable, and then run it through the mean function, right? Because I want to get the mean of this variable. So that's one thing to note here. Second, a lot of our functions don't natively handle missing values. Uh, so that is, sorry, they do natively handle missing values, but they don't automatically handle missing values. So a lot of statistics packages, data included, will if you, if you give it uh, some data that has some missing values in it, it will just delete all the missing observations and then run whatever analysis it needs to run. Not what R does. In R, it wants you to recognize that that's what you're doing. Uh, and so a lot of functions will not automatically drop missing values, you need to specify it yourself. Now, a lot of, op a lot of them will as well, which is, that's one of the, that's an annoying thing for me because it's inconsistent in that way. But a lot won't. Uh, mean is an example of one of them. If you take, if I'm, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to take uh, just the first element of my D variable. Right, so what's happening here? I'm taking my data set, DF, and pulling out the D variable, the dollar sign. I'm taking just the first element of that D variable uh, with the uh, square brackets, and I'm going to assign that NA. NA is sort of our generic missing value. Uh, so I'm, I'm making that missing value, and I'm going to take the mean of this variable again, but this time it gives me a missing result. It doesn't take out the missing value that I have and then get the result mean of the rest. It just says no, it's missing. If there's something missing. Eh. So in most cases when this happens, you can, uh, if you do want it just to delete all the missing values, you can do that with na.rm equals true. That's certainly the case in the case of the mean function. Okay. 
So we have our idea of what data sets are. We have a little bit of an idea of how functions and syntax works, which we've been going through the whole time. Let's talk about how we can get data to work. Uh, well, one nice thing about R is there are lots and lots and lots of built-in data sets. You could very easily run your entire econometrics class without ever having to deal with students and, like using files, which is nice because that's where a lot of student uh, um, I, that's where a lot of students rely on you for IT help, which is not what you want to be doing. Uh, so a lot of packages have built-in data sets. So you saw before that I loaded in that scorecard data set using the data function. Data function will give you access to all the, uh, the data sets that, that are in the libraries that you currently have loaded. So I would just recommend try typing in data and then a parenthesis and see what pops up. It'll show you all the data sets that are currently available to you. Uh, there are a lot of packages that have data sets in them as well. Uh, so uh, if you, uh, for example, the ECDAT package has a lot of data sets specifically designed for econometrics, right? Uh, so a lot of example data sets, uh, I use this one a lot. There's also this list here that if you click on it, if you go to those slides again, remember the link back at the beginning, click on that, go to the slides, or go to this list, which has a list of a lot, a lot, a lot of different data sets that, and the packages that they're in. So you can just load those data sets or load, load those packages. You'll have access to all those data sets and your students can easily too. For example, Every Woldridge uh, 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 data set is available in the Woldridge package. Uh, you can get all the five thirty, a lot of the five thirty eight data sets in the five thirty eight package. Uh, so there's a lot of cool stuff available there. But if you do need to handle files, uh, one easy way to pass the files in. First of all, there is of course the R data format. You could do some of the data processing yourself. Save it as an R dot an, a dot R data file, uh, which the, with the save function, and then give that to your students. If they just double click it, it will open up, or they can use the load function to load it into their to their R Studio. Um, that's one option. Or you can give them a CSV file. Read.csv will read in read, read uh, will read in CSV files. You just give it the file name and of course you navigate to the right working directory. It will load it in as a data frame. Uh, there are if you want to go beyond CSVs uh, or R data files, you might have to use a package. Uh, some common ones are the Haven package, uh, which gives you access to uh, read underscore DTA, which reads in state of files. Uh, read underscore CSV, which is a slightly different version of read.csv. Uh, or the foreign package, uh, which gives you access to even more different kinds of data sets. You can read in SAS data sets, you can read in all kinds of stuff. So whatever data set format you have, there's almost certainly a function in Haven or foreign uh, that can read it in for you. Uh, notice, by the way, one nice thing. I mentioned how uh, annoying it is to have students have to deal with files. If you do have to have a file, uh, you can skip having to have them put it on their computer. You can just store it on the internet somewhere, give them the URL for it, because all these functions will work with URLs as well. They don't have to actually download the file. There are also a lot of data sets that are designed not just to um, download or not just to, not with data in them, but they make it easy to import data uh, from different sources. So for example, if you want to download data directly from Fred, Fred R. If you want to download data directly from the World Bank, there's World Bank stats, right? So uh, this, this list that I have here on my econometrics page will give you a rundown of some of the ones that you might find handy in econometrics. You could avoid all this. You know, it, it, uh, there's you know, one that read in IPUMS, there's one that read in Google Trends, whatever you want your students to have access to, they can probably read it in in an easy way. Uh, I will give a little plug here uh, for my VTable package, uh, which once you have your data set in is a very good way to look at data uh, and explore it beyond just looking at the whole spreadsheet by itself. It'll give you some nice little summary tables and things like that. Anyway. Okay, so we have our data set in, we want to manipulate it, we want to you know make some new variables, we want to uh, select some observations, what do we want to do? Uh, so there's lots of different ways in R to manipulate data, maybe too many ways. Uh, but the three main ones are base R, which I've already showed you a little bit. That's with like the dollar signs, signing new variables that way. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. It, it. It's fine. A lot of people use it. But um, I think for students, it's probably a little bit harder to get their head around. And for econometrics, it's the, probably the easiest way to go is the dplyr package. There's also something called data.table, data.table package, which is a lot faster than dplyr. And it's very commonly used in data science. Uh, I think it's a little bit harder to use. Um, it's not that hard, but uh, uh, I, for undergrad econometrics, I'd say dplyr is probably your way to go. Um, and so, because it just sort of matches the way that economists think about dplyr. Plus, it has a very similar syntax to SQL. So if they're ever going to use SQL in the future, learning dplyr will give them a sort of leg up in learning SQL later. Anyway. It also comes with something called the pipe that I think makes undergrad programming, for, especially for students who are not programmers, way easier. It makes the code easier to read. It makes it easier to write. It makes it easier to not make little mistakes. We'll talk about the pipe too. Uh, Dplyr also handles missing values better than base R. One of the big headaches doing data manipulation in base R is if your data has anything missing, all that stuff that I mentioned about 
are, are not really handling missing values automatically, gets in, it makes things so hard to do. Uh, I had to bang my head against the wall for ages until I found dplyr, which handles missing values a little bit better. Uh, and also the consistent syntax. Uh, once you learn that how one of the dplyr functions works, you can probably guess how the other ones work. They all sort of work in similar ways. Okay. Uh, I tend to load in the dplyr package using something called the tidyverse package. So tidyverse is sort of a, a world of R in that, that works a slightly differently than the way, the way that our uh, base R does. I like it a lot better. A lot of people like it. I think it makes things a lot easier. I recommend it for undergrad econometrics. Plus, if you load in the tidyverse, you get both dplyr and ggplot2, uh, which gets you most of the way there to probably most of what you need. Okay, so talk about dplyr. So I want to manipulate some data. The way the data, that dplyr works is it tries to take the idea of manipulating data and compress it down to a small number of verbs that it uses to act on data. So you want to create a new variable, mutate. Mutate is the verb there. You can use that to create new variables in your data set. Arrange sorts the data. Filter picks rows, picks observations. Uh, select picks columns, it picks variables. Uh, and then there's all the grouping operations with the group underscore by. You use group underscore by to turn your data set into a grouped data set. And then every calculation that you do beyond that uh, with either mutate uh, or summarize, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, is done at the group level. Uh, so if I do, you know, if I have this data set of countries uh, and countries by year, uh, and I have maybe the GDP, and I want to get the average GDP in that country over all the years, I would do group by year. Uh, and then I would do summarize, which would uh, take that uh, and collapse it down to whatever my group level is. Uh, and I would say summarize, get the mean of GDP. And it would average it over all those years. Um, and it would do it by year. I could also use mutate to create new variables. So if I want to, let's say, see how much each country's GDP has grown since its first observation, I would do group by country. And then I would do mutate to create a new variable. Uh, and I would say, take the first observation of GDP. And then I would do everything relative to that. So I could see how things changed since the first observation of GDP. All right. Summarize, like I said, collapses things down to your group level. So you group it by, let's say, country, country and year. You have multiple observations for those things. Summarize would squash it down to just being one. Uh, and you would, of course, specify what those calculations are. You want to take the mean of some variables. You want to take the first observation of others. You want to take the max or the min or you know, whatever. You, whatever I would add. Okay. If you want to get really fancy, uh, you know, you can use scoped versions of these, uh, which actually, now that I've mentioned that since I've written this, that's a little bit outdated. Use a cross now, but don't worry about it. Um, anyway, uh, now the tidy, these are, these are the main ones. There are many other functions in here, <laughs> both in dplyr and in tidyr, which comes along with tidyverse as well, uh, for manipulating data. But for the purpose of undergrad econometrics, most of the time they're not doing a lot of data manipulation anyway. This is going to be plenty. Um, so, uh, this is all you need to know. This is, of course, all, the tidyverse also comes with, um, uh, if you're coming from Stata, the equivalent of merge, uh, the join functions are in dplyr. Uh, they're a little bit more flexible, actually, in dplyr. You can specify, okay, I want to keep the observations from this and the rows from this. And, da, 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 da. Um, and then uh, uh, it's also easier because you don't have to necessarily, because, because you can have, hold two data sets in, in memory at once, unlike in Stata until recently. Um, it's very easy to do things like, um, or you don't necessarily have to save one to file so that you can merge to it. It's not a problem that I run into in state all the time. Anyway, join functions are there for merging. The pivot functions in tidy R are a, a, a way of a reshaping data. You want to go from wide to long or long to wide, then you use the, the pivot functions. Uh, and you can learn about all this, by the way, in the, the data wrangling swirl class that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so that's one thing you might want to run through, especially if you are uh, still getting used to, to R, I would recommend doing this. I think once you learn dplyr, for an economist anyway, the rest of R becomes much easier and easier to think about. So I, I would recommend doing that and starting here uh, if you're still a little bit confused. Okay, just some quick examples. I'm gonna load in some data. I'm gonna load some of the, some ATIS data, American Time Use Survey. Like I said, a lot of packages just have data in them. Uh, the American Time Use Survey is available to me in the ATIS package. I'm gonna load up the ATIS package. I'm gonna load up the ATIS data set. I'm gonna do a couple manipulations to it. So uh, I'm gonna take my ATIS act data. I'm going to mutate it. I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to take my tier code variable. And I'm going to squash it down to two different uh, levels of precision. First of all, I'm going to get it at the four-digit activity level and the two-digit activity level. I'm going to do that by just taking my tier code, dividing it by some number, and then chopping off everything after the decimal floor function. Uh, then I'm going to use filter, like I said, which selects, uh, selects rows, selects observations, to so just keep the ones where two-digit activity is equal to 
one. I want that first uh, two-digit activity. I don't even remember what it is, actually. But so what have I done? I've used my verbs. I started with my data set, ADAS ACT. I used mutate to create two new variables, and then I filtered to select some observations on the basis of a variable, right? And I said, I put a logical statement in here. If two-digit activity is equal to one, keep it. Otherwise, toss it. Uh, doing some more. Uh, so let's say I want to take my new ADAS ACT variable, which of course only has that one uh, activity, the, the, the two-digit uh, activity of one. Then I'm going to group by the four-digit activity. So now everything I do after this is going to be the, I did, the calculations are going to be done within each four-digit activity. So it's going to do each four-digit activity separately, and then it's going to squash together the results at the end. I'm going to use summarize to collapse my data down. So what I'm going to end up with is one row per value of four-digit activity. Okay. Um, I'm going to do, I'm going to take the mean of the duration of this activity with, of course, not.rm equal to true. So I can get rid of the, the missing observations when I do this calculation. And we get the standard deviation as well. And I end up with, of course, one observation per four digit activity. I have the, a, a, a column for the mean of the duration of that activity and the standard deviation of that activity. Uh, I also arranged, I sorted by uh, uh, negative of mean uh, duration so that I had the most common activity up top and the least common activities down at the bottom. And once I created this very this data set, once I did all these manipulations, I saved it as ADASACT underscore summary. And then I said, show me ADASACT underscore summary. So that's all I'm doing. I'm just applying these verbs to my data set, ending up with new manipulations. Um, this makes a lot of things really easy. Uh, so summary statistics, for example, are very easy. If I want to get statistics within groups, I use, I use group by and summarize to get statistics within groups. Super easy. Um, uh, you, can, you can get a typical summary statistics table using the stargazer uh, function in the stargazer package. Um, you could also use the sum table function in my V table package. I think it works a little better. Hey, just I'm saying. Uh, but stargazer is certainly more popular uh, and more well known. Um, I will say um, if you're using dplyr, uh, often it will output something not called a data.frame, called a tibble, which is just a data.frame with a couple of extra bells and whistles. Don't worry too much about it, except that stargazer does not like them. Some table does in B table, just saying. Um, so if you want to use both dplyr and stargazer, you got to run it through as.data.frame before sending it to stargazer. Um, but here, what I've got here uh, is I'm taking my ADIS data, I'm selecting just some columns. I only want these variables, turn it into a data frame for me, and then give me the stargazer summary statistics table. And then here it is. Right? Here's a summary statistics table. I could turn this in with my, with my homework. You'll have noticed, by the way. All these things that I was doing had this little business right here, old percent sign, then the, uh, the greater than sign, then another percent sign. That's called a pipe. Uh, and it makes our programming way easier, so much easier. Uh, so it's, it's technically from the package called Nagritar, but it's also in the Tiverse. You load up the Tiverse or dplyr by itself, you get the pipe. Um, and now what the pipe does is that whatever's on the left side of the pipe becomes the first argument of the function on the right side of the pipe. All it does. Now, this actually makes it way easier to construct code, way easier to write code, way easier to avoid things like balancing parentheses, which students have a very hard time with. That basic idea here is take an object, ship it along, make some changes, ship it along, make some changes, ship it along. It's like a conveyor belt. Your object is riding through a conveyor belt, and every step on the conveyor belt, something's happening to it, and then it moves on to the next step until it comes out the other end with all the changes that you want. Uh, this allows you to avoid things like nested functions, like Take this variable, run it through a function. Now run that through another function. Now run that through another function. That gets complex. Instead, one thing after the other, after the other. Uh, so nice tricks with the pipe. Uh, one thing you can notice is that uh, a lot of the time you're going to start with a data set and, and you're going to run it through some pipes. Okay, that's often what you're going to be doing, especially in dplyr. All those functions work on data sets. Uh, and uh, uh, what's actually, I, I should probably actually specify here. So let's do a quick data, dplyr example. So I've got some dplyr stuff going on here, right? I take this scorecard data set, I group it by unit ID, and then I do some summarizing, okay? Um, and uh, what's actually happening here? Let's take a look at mutate function. Oops, I forgot that I restarted on. So notice here, the first argument of mutate is not what variable do you want to put in? It's data. Now, I didn't put in a data set here, did I? Well, actually, I did because I used the pipe, right? I started with this data set and I piped it along to this function. Now, the, that, that, this data set becomes the first argument of the function on the right. 
group by, summarize, mutate. Like I mentioned, they have a consistent syntax where the data set always comes first. Okay, so whatever data set I'm shipping along becomes the first argument. And there we go. Right. So I don't need to type the data set over and over again. I just say scorecard, but it becomes the first argument in, in group by. Uh, and then I take this group's data set, that becomes the first argument in summarize. I take that summarized data set, that becomes the first argument in mutate. Okay. Um, also, something else to notice, by the way, these three dots, forgot to mention earlier, when these three dots show up, this is where the documentation in R gets a little bit sparser. But basically, this just, this just means whatever goes here. <laughs> so um, this function mutate accepts any number of variables that I want to create. I can create multiple variables at once. So how, what do I want to put in there? Whatever, right? Variable, another variable, another variable, another variable, dot, dot, dot. Uh, so this sort of allows our function to take complex arguments. You usually have to read the, the, uh, the documentation to figure out what it means, right? So this says name, value, bears, pairs of expression. So variable equals this thing. Variable equals this thing. Those are the pairs. And you have as many of them as I want, and thus the, the dot, dot. Anyway. All right, so some things with the pipe. Um, so, um, first of all, as I mentioned, you're usually passing a data set along the pipe, but it doesn't have to be this, it can be anything. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, you can take a function, pass it through a pipe. You can take an, a list and pass it through a pipe. You can take a number and pass it through a pipe. Anything, as long as whatever it is on the left, you're good with becoming the thing on the right. Uh, and con the way that this mostly kind of like comes, comes up to be a problem is, well, what if you want to start with a data set but then work with one of the variables from the data set. You need to take that data set, that variable out of the data set in order to be working with the variable, right? Because if I said, okay, take this data set, filter it just to this four digit activity, and then take them, I wanna take the median of one of these variables. I can't do that with just the, the data set itself. I need to pull the variable out of the data set first. So I take my data set, I filter it to just these observations, then I pull this variable out. So now I'm no longer working with the data set, I'm just working with that variable, okay? Uh, and then I'm gonna take that variable and take the median of it. You'll notice, by the way, this is a lot easier to read than this. This is that nested functions thing I talked about. If I wanna take the median of the duration for, this, for the four digit activity of 104, what can I do? Well, I can filter my, my data set to just that four digit activity. I can then pull the, the variable out of it with the dollar sign, and then I can wrap that all in median. That's really complex to follow. You have to really think hard about how to structure all that, or I can work step by step. I can take my data set, pass it to filter to get the data, the observations I want, pass that to pull to pull out the variable set that I want, and then pass it to median to get the median of that variable. Another thing to note with the pipe is that sometimes a variable, uh, a function that's not in the Tativerse will not play nicely with the pipe. That is, it will not take a data set as its first argument when you want it to. So for, uh, this often, often comes up with the LM function, which is for regressions. Uh, so uh, let's say I want to run a regression, um, but, the but data is not the first argument of LM. So if I just take ADASAC and I pass it to LM, it will not get it right. It'll try to fill it in the formula. Because remember, the formula was the first argument of LM from earlier. But I can fix that really easy. I just use the dot. So if I use ADASAC and then I pipe it to LM, where if I put the dot, that just means the data set that I'm passing in with the pipe. Okay, so if I do data equals dot, that means that the data object is now going to be ADASAC and I can run whatever function or whatever uh, regression I want. Now here, of course, I'm taking this regression object, I'm passing that to the residual function, right? You can pass anything through a pipe. It doesn't have to be a data set, doesn't have to be a variable. Here I'm passing a regression to the residual function, getting the residual of that, of that regression. Now I've got residuals, I'm gonna pass that to the standard deviation. So now I can get the standard deviation of the residuals by starting with the data set, turning it into a regression object, turning that into a vector of residuals, turning that into, into a standard deviation number, right? So I'm passing everything along one step at a time. You can very clearly see what I'm doing every step. Speaking of regressions, let's talk about regressions. So regression is something we do a lot of in econometrics. Uh, so in, in, uh, in R, regressions are, of course, objects. Um, regression functions they take data, they take a formula, they give you a regression object as an output. Uh, a typical uh, inputs to regression would be a formula object, a data set, and whatever options you want to set. It will output a regression object, which is generally intended to be stored and run through some other fo function. One thing that confuses R, uh, people with R for a lot when they use it the first time, is you run a regression and it gives you back very little information. Because you're not really meant to just look at a regression. You're meant to take a regression object and let's say put it through a summary function or some other function that is intended to show you all the detail that you want of the regression object. Once you have your regression object, uh, you can look at the outcome often with the summary function. We'll show you a lot of the information about the regression object. Uh, or you can run it through a function that is intended to give you a, like, let's say a regression table. Uh, a very common one is the stargazer uh, 
pack, uh, function from the Stargazer package. I mentioned earlier, you can use Stargazer to create um, uh, summary statistics tables. You can also use it to create regression tables as well. Um, nice thing about Stargazer, it's very attuned to economists' wants and needs. And so it sort of looks like you would expect as an economist, a regression table or a descriptive statistics table. Um, you can also run that regression object through other functions. So, you know, in Stata, how do you get the predicted values from regression? Well, you run the regression, and then afterwards you say the predict command. That's not how it works here. Here we're going to run regression, we're going to store our regression object, and we're going to run our regression object through the predict function, which takes the predicted values out of a regression object, right? So we're, again, where everything is objects and functions, and we're running those objects through. Uh, you can also get relevant statistics out of your regression with the dollar sign. A regression is a list. You can get objects out of it with the dollar sign or the double brackets. Uh, so you maybe you want to get the R squared out of your regression. Well, it's the dollar sign, right? You can pull your statistics out of there. It's just a list full of stuff. Uh, some of those relevant statistics, by the way, are in the summary object itself. This can sometimes be confusing. Uh, you know, if you want to get that R squared out, I think it's actually not in the, in the regression object itself. You have to get the summary of the regression object and then use the dollar sign to get the R squared out of that. Oh, like this. So here, we're running a regression. Uh, so what regression am I running? Well, I'm using the ATIS REST data. I'm running a regression of hourly wage on household size and hours worked per week. I'm storing that regression as my.reg. I can get predictions for my regression using the predict function. I take my regression object, my.reg, run it through the predict function, and I get a vector of predictions, reg.predictions. Uh, I can get the R squared value by taking a summary of my regression and get, using the dollar sign to pull out the R squared. Now, one thing to note, this is now this is going to be a headache, uh, is that the significance stars on a summary of a regression are not the economic, economic standard. So economic standards would be one star is 10%, uh, two stars is 5%, three stars is, is 0.01, is, is, uh, is 1%. I say 1% already, 10%, 5%, one, you know. Uh, in R, they're sort of shifted over by one. Um, so uh, one star is 5%, two stars is 1%, and three stars is 0.01%, I think. Um, so looking at this, right, so uh, here doesn't make a difference because it's a super tiny p-value, um, but uh, uh, it is shifted over. So that's something to think about. So let's talk about how to make a regression table. So I mentioned, uh, 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 so if I have a bunch of regressions or even one regression, I want it to look nice. I don't want to just give you a summary because like that's like, you know, this is my output. I can copy this in or whatever, but it doesn't look very good. I want it to look good. And maybe I want to put multiple regressions on the same table. There are so many functions that do this. Um, there's sort of an a, a embarrassment of them. That is one of the downsides of R, by the way, is that there's so many different packages. Sometimes they do the same thing and you don't really know which one's the best. Uh, I'm going to recommend two here. One is the Stargazer package. So Stargazer um, is a package, kind of old, um, and uh, uh, it will create regression tables for you. It will also create, so if you pass it a regression object, it will create a regression table for you. If you pass it a data frame, it will create a summary statistics table for you. Um, you can, of course, print these to the screen, setting type equal to text. You can uh, turn it into an HTML file that you can copy and paste into Word. Uh, you can also, it, by default, it does LaTeX which is typically not what your undergrad students are going to want, but you could. Um, all the de defaults are what economists would expect. So the stars are 10, 5, and 1. Uh, it sort of lays out the regression in the way that economists tend to expect it, where coefficients up here, and then the standard error is down here in parentheses. Uh, so it doesn't like auto, it doesn't make default give you the T statistic, which some packages will do. Uh, it shows you some of the, expe the expected statistics down here that you would expect. Observations R squared adjusted R squared. Um, so it sort of does things as economists would expect. It has sort of a lot of options that you can choose. So if I only want to keep some of the coefficients, I can do that. That's easy to do. Um, so uh, upsides and downsides with Stargazer. So upside, it's one package, and you can do both your summary statistic tables and your regression tables with that one package. Two, it's very easy to use. All you got to do is take your, your data set, boom, now you have a, a, a summary statistics table. Take your regressions, boom, now you have a regression object. You, have, you do have to remember to say type equals text or type equals HTML, because what are you going to do with the, with the lot tech or what's an undergrad going to do with the lot tech? Uh, downsides. Uh, it's old, and so it doesn't support everything. So sometimes if you do, for example, I'm going to recommend a little bit later, uh, the estimator package for some regressions, it doesn't work with those at all. It just doesn't work. Uh, I mentioned already before that it doesn't work with tibbles. So, you know, you have to do a little bit of, it, you have to be a little bit careful about what you recommend your students use if you want to then have them pass it to Stargate. Uh, that's the downside. Uh, there are a lot of other packages that will do regression tables very easily for you as well. Uh, Huxtable, for example, um, uh, but I would recommend actually the JTools package. It does a couple things for us. So first, one downside is it doesn't, doesn't do summary statistics tables. Of course, you could do those with 
some with some table and B table. That's like the third time I've said that. But um, one thing, they got a couple of nice things about JTools. JTools is a package. The one, it handles those weird regression types. Any sort of regression you run, JTools probably be able to handle it and give you a regression table. Two, uh, it allows you to do VIFs and robust standard errors. So robust standard errors are another sort of sticking point in R. They're kind of tough to do. They're not intuitive. They're not just sort of comma robust as you would do in Stata. I mean, that's one of those things where it's by statisticians for statisticians. It's not quite so much doing the economist style thing of robust standard errors all the time. Uh, so it's not as easy to do. But uh, uh, JTools will make it very easy to do robust standard errors. Uh, you can do VIFs with, with uh, the sum function in, in JTools. You can do standardized coefficients if you like. Uh, or you can use the export sums function to print tables to file very easily. Um, uh, also, in addition, JTools will make some nice graphs of your regression. So effect plot will do very easy uh, regression scatter plot graphing where it'll give you the, um, uh, the scatter plot and then it'll put a regression line on top of it. Uh, and it specifically, it'll make it easy to do that even, that when, even when you have a lot of like controls in your regression. Like that's super easy to do when it's just an X and a Y and there's no controls. But when you have controls, that can be tougher to do, but effect plot will do it for you. Or plot underscore coefs will literally take the coefficients in your model and plot them with their 95% confidence intervals on a graph. Uh, now you do have to reset the stars. Uh, so this will not give you the standard star levels. Uh, so, but it's easy to do with the stars option here. So I just take this line right here, the stars equals uh, C, three stars is one, two stars is five, one star is 0.1. Um, and, uh, uh, I just copy and paste that into every export sums function that I use. And so this is the sort of output that you get. You can copy this very easily into a Word document uh, or whatever. These are the kinds of graphs that you can get. So let's say I have a regression, let's say with a quadratic. That can be sometimes difficult to graph out, but effect plot will do that for you. Uh, or plot coef. So I've actually plotted out the coefficients with the 95% confidence intervals, which are very narrow here. Like that, uh, And that's very easy to do. So I've been doing all these regressions. How have I I've been constructing these regression formulas? How can I put together a regression formula? So the way that regression formulas in R are generally structured, you have an outcome, and then this tilde, you know, like you, something is distributed according to this, which is more of a proper way. And like I said, it's by statisticians. Uh, so, and then on the right side, we have our independent variables, whatever independent variable you have, plus whatever other independent variable you have. So you add together the different elements as though you're writing a regression equation. Um, if you put in a factor variable there, it will automatically be turned into dummies. So you don't need to create your own dummy variables. No point in it. Um, so if you just do um, y tilde x plus, if, if z was already a factor variable, you wouldn't need to do this. But if you wanted to turn it into a factor variable to make this work, you could do factor of z and it would work fine. Interactions are with stars. So y uh, tilde x star z would give you a regression of, x on, of y on x and z and their interaction. Uh, you can do just the interaction with colon. So y tilde x plus x colon z would give you x and then x times z. You can do full interaction sets, although this doesn't come up super often in econometrics. By just putting parentheses around things and then squaring them gives you all the, all the two-way interactions. Put it to the third power to give you all the three-way interactions as well. Uh, one nice thing about R is the functions go straight in. So you don't need to like create a variable log income. You can just take the log of income and put it right in your regression. There you go. Um, you can do um, uh, calculations with variables using the I function. So for example, if you want to, let's say I want to regress uh, a, bi a binary is Y equal to one. I, I take Y equals to one, run it through I, that will give me that outcome and just put it in my regression. Or I can square things directly in the regression line as well. Like, uh, I of X squared would give me X squared in the regression equation. If you have a lot of variables, you notice by the way, in all of these, I'm having to type out all of my variable names. Uh, you can, uh, you do lots of variables in one by using y tilde dot. The dot just says all the variables that I have not yet referred to in this regression equation. Okay. So if you combine that with selecting, if you, if you use select to just get a data set of all the variables that you want in your regression plus the outcome, uh, and then you do y tilde dot, it will run the regression of everything that you want. It's nice. Uh, you can combine this in the tidyverse with the tidy select helpers like this. So if I select, say select of starts underscore with GDP. This will give me all of the variables that start with the letters GDP underscore. Uh, so I can easily select lots of variables that way, pass through a regression with the dot in it, and then it will regress all of those variables. Regression commands. Uh, so what can I actually run, can I, how can I actually run a regression? The standard is LM, a standard OLS. Does not do robust standard errors. You gotta do a whole bunch of other stuff to do that, um, but does standard OLS. 
you want to do time series, there's all kinds of time series tools in R. I would recommend looking at the Dyne LM for dynamic linear modeling for lags and stuff. Forecast uh, package for forecasting in the future. Uh, the T series package is good. Uh, things like um, autocorrelation functions, partial autocorrelation functions are, are based in R. You don't need to use a package for those at all. All kinds of options available for you. Um, now, all micro can be done in a couple of packages. Uh, so if you want to do stuff like robust standard errors, clustering, instrumental variables, fixed effects, uh, all four of those things can be done in one of two packages. Uh, by which I mean all four of them can be done in one package, and you can just choose which package is. Those two packages are estimator, uh, without, without last vowel, sort of like Tumblr. Uh, that is the functions lm underscore robust, which does robust standard errors or clustering uh, or fixed effects, um, and iv robust, which does robust standard errors, clustering, fixed effects, but also instrument with instrumental variables on top. Um, uh, or the LFE package, uh, which has the FALM function, which that one function will do uh, clustering, fixed effects, robust standard errors, instrumental variables, all four of those in one. So you can do pretty much all of applied micro in FELM, <laughs> at least at the undergrad level. Um, the former, the estimator package, I think has easier syntax. It's easier to put together an equation but it still has some, it's a little bit newer, still has some bugs in it and doesn't work with Stargazer. Uh, FELM from the LFE package is harder to put together an equation, but it does work with Stargazer. It's also faster uh, quite a bit, um, especially when you have uh, lots of fixed effects. Um, but in either case, you can use export sums uh, or Huxtable to export. Uh, if you wanna do a joint F test, that's a common thing in undergrad econometrics, you can use the linear hypothesis function in the CAR, it's a R function, or the CAR package has the linear hypothesis uh, function in it, fairly easy to use. Uh, and then of course there's other models, you know, if you wanna do like Heckman, you wanna do uh, a probit by the way, is with the GLM function. Uh, so you use GLM, the link, probit link or a logit link or whatever. Um, uh, uh, but anything you wanna do, survival model, Heckman, whatever, uh, you just Google it. R, Google it, or R stats, uh, if R is not Googling anything for you because it's just a letter. Uh, you can do our stats and that will usually pop it up as well. There's lots of online resources for whatever you want to do. Okay, how about graphing for a little bit? So uh, I used to uh, teach uh, base R plotting because um, I thought it was a little bit easier. Uh, I think ggplot's worth it. That's slightly more difficult to, to get started on than base R plotting, but it looks so much nicer um, and uh, you, it's so much more flexible too. So it's also very, a lot easier to do things like graphing separately by group. Very easy to do in ggplot. So it's a top tier graphing tool it's used in places like 538 and BBC and uh, all sorts and The Economist and all sorts of other places use ggplot. Uh, and the way that it works is that each graph consists of three things, uh, at least data set, an aesthetic, which basically just describes all the axes that all your, your, your data varies on. So that's gonna be your X axis, your Y axis, but also stuff like, I want the color to be different by this variable, right? So I wanna color differently different countries. Maybe I wanna do that or line type to be different, or the size to be different, or whatever. And a geometry, geometry is what actually gets drawn on the thing. So I want you to draw me a scatter plot. So I'll add a, a point, a point uh, ge a geometry. I want you to draw me a line graph, I'll add a line geometry. Uh, the syntax is not too difficult to use. Uh, it can get really in the weeds for super advanced styling, but if you just want something basic that a student can turn in for a homework assignment, it's, still, it's not very difficult uh, to put together. Uh, you can also use the, uh, the GG Easy package to put together uh, functions or put together uh, plots it can be a lot easier. Uh, there's uh, there's some other stuff out there that make, can make it even easier. There's a drag and drop system, which the name is escaping me. Oh, what's it called? S, it's got a weird name. S S S scroller. I forget. If you Google point and click ggplot, I'm sure it'll pop up. So here's how it works. So we're gonna load our data set. I'm gonna put in those three elements that I talked about. So I'm gonna plot my data set, empty cars. It's a tidyverse function, so the data set always goes first. I got my aesthetic, and uh, that tells me the axes along which things are varying. So I want my x-axis to be the horsepower uh, variable, and I want my y-axis to be the miles per gallon variable. And I'm gonna add with plus the geometry of the point geometry. So I'm gonna put a, a scatter plot on. What if I wanna color separately by the type of transmission? I just set the color axis. Uh, so it's the factor variable. I would, I, you know, for the different kinds of transmissions there are, uh, I set it to this variable, and it will color separately by the values of my variable. 
Uh, I can do things like add on top. And this is getting, uh, this is about as complex as I can imagine undergraduate graph getting. And of course, it gets much more complex than that. There's whole books written on this function. Um, but this is, uh, this is as complex as I can imagine you assigning anybody to do anything. So what I'm going to do here. So first, I'm going to take my data set. I'm going to use dplyr in the pipe to mutate a new variable in there, transmission. So instead of just having the am variable be a zero or a one, I want you to actually know what it is. So I'm going to turn it into a factor with labels on it. I'm going to take that data set. And I'm going to have my horsepower on the x-axis, my miles per gallon on the y-axis. I'm going to set both the shape and the color separately by transmission. So you can see that the, that the uh, manual transmissions are triangles. The circular transmissions are, autom are, are the automatic transmissions are circular. And also one is blue and the other is red. I'm going to add my point geometry on there. I'm also going to add a theme. There's lots of themes that you can do. My favorite is theme minimal. That's sort of my go-to. I'm going to add a uh, regression line on top of it. So the geom smooth function or geometry adds on a smoothing function, in this case, a, a, a linear model uh, with the 95% uh, confidence intervals. And I'm going to uh, title everything. So I'm gonna put an x-axis title of horsepower, I'm gonna y-axis title of miles per gallon, uh, a, um, and uh, the title of the actual plot itself of miles per gallon versus horsepower. I could have also set uh, the color title in here and it would have color titled this, uh, this legend over here with whatever I said. Line plots are also very easy. So I load in the economics data set, which comes with the ggplot package. Uh, and so I'm gonna plot a date on the x-axis. Uh, it will uh, of course recognize that these are, uh, it's actually months in the data set, but it, it, when it pulls back out, it says, oh, there's a lot of data set here. I'm only gonna show you the year. It's smart about that. I'm gonna show the unemployment to population ratio over time. I'm gonna add a, a line geometry, use the black and white theme for kicks and giggles, right, whatever, whatever. Notice by the way, I'm, uh, I'm storing this as an object, right? The plots themselves are object. I'm storing it as an object. If I want to see that, I'm just going to put it on its own line. So, but line graphs or, or line graphs and point graphs are going to be cover most of what you're going to do. Uh, if you want to do a density plot, I guess geom underscore density will give you a density plot. Okay, so there's only so much that I can cover. There's of course a lot more out there in the world. Uh, so explore. Uh, there's lots of resources out there available. There's lots of books. There's lots of slides. There's lots of presentations. You can do whatever. Um, I would recommend trying a swirl class if you're just starting out. Uh, it will really walk you through sort of the best practices for how you can get this. So you don't just like find the first Google of what it is, and maybe that's not really the best way to do it. This will walk you through some proper uh, things. Also check out the materials on my website. I think they'll be handy. Uh, a couple of quick extras. So one, rstudio.cloud. So as you're teaching, uh, one thing that uh, might be nice is rstudio.cloud. It's a cloud-based version of rstudio that's completely free, at least for now. Um, it allows you to use R without installing anything, so your students don't have to bother installing R on their own laptops. Um, it also has classroom tools, like uh, you can set a project and have everybody do their own version of the project um, uh, so that you can use that as homework. Uh, so let me actually show you, it takes a second to load. One, the one downside of it's a little slow. So I've created a workspace over here for the class that I taught. Uh, and if I go in here, you can see uh, all the homework assignment projects that I created uh, and also the versions that the students turned in. Uh, so this is a copy of the project that I created. When they went into that project, uh, it automatically created their own copy and they were working in their own space on that project. I can go in and look at what they're doing. Uh, so if they're like, hey, can you help me with my code? I can literally go in and sort of look over their shoulder in their code uh, and, and do that with them. Let me show you what it looks like. So if I click on one of these projects, it's going to basically just open up our studio for me. This is the slow part, uh, by the way. Um, it's going to look like our studio. Uh, I can I can upload files here for them to work with. So if I want to work to work with a data file, I can upload it here. They can load it very easily. I can set up some libraries already installed on one of these, uh, so they don't have to worry about installing packages. Um, I can load things. All right, so I can set them up with an environment that's already sort of there. If I want them to sort of enter in and not have to deal with the setup, I can do the setup for them and then it will be automatically replicated for them in each of them. So in this case, uh, I have uh, the homework assignment over here. In this case, I think I, it wasn't a code assignment, so I started as a Word doc, but in most of them it would be a code file and the code here, the homework would open up here as a code assignment and they could, they could fill it in however they want. And then they're of course working in R as it normally would be. Um, some pros, they don't have to install anything. They don't have to mess with as much stuff. You can do all the file sharing and stuff for them beforehand. It's also sort of set up for them. You can even handle packages for them if you like.
Um, the cons, as of right now, there's not really a great due date system. So if you want to use it for homework, it's kind of hard uh, in that you can't like say, oh, your assignment was late because it doesn't really show you when they turned it in. Uh, there's also no grading system on there. Uh, it can be a little slow to start up. So um, if you are going to use it for home, if you're going to use it for like class activities, fantastic for that. Like everybody working together on the same project, but in their own little space, nothing better. Um, but for a homework assignment, it can be a little iffy because there's not really a good way to do some of the things that we would want it to do. But maybe they're working on that. I know that they want this to be a classroom tool, so they're probably going to fix some of that stuff in the future. A little slow to start up at the moment. Also, our markdown. Uh, so these slides are not in PowerPoint uh, or Beamer. These are in our markdown. Uh, so our markdown is a notebook system. Uh, so if you've heard about reproducible work, uh, that's one thing that, our, uh, that this is. Um, so a markdown is a very basic text formatting thing. So think about like when you put like asterisks to indicate bold, like that's, that's, or that's about the extent that markdown is. Like it can do links, it can do bold, it can do whatever. It can do images and bulleted lists, but it doesn't do everything. It's very simple to use. Um, our Markdown is an implementation of Markdown, uh, and it, it integrates code and text together in a very easy way. Uh, so very easy to include code in your document. So if you're doing a, a presentation that has a lot of code in it, like I've done here, uh, then uh, it's very easy to, get, to have the code in your document, have it show up as formatted code, and have it run inside the document. And so you get the results of your code inside your document as well. I find it very handy to do for slides. For pretty much every class that I do that has a programming element in it, I do the slides in our markdown. You can also do automatic publication to our pubs. Um, so if you want your uh, students to, for example, do a homework assignment with, with R, you might want to have them do their code in an R markdown notebook. It's not just slides, it's also documents. You can make HTML documents, you can make PDF documents. Um, and if you have, make them have, have them make HTML documents, um, you can have them, they can be automatically published uh, when they are done to our pubs so you, they can give you just give you a link and you can, they can turn it in that way if you like um, or you can have them do a PDF and upload or whatever. Let's take a look at some of the co some code. Uh, so I have a bunch of R markdowns open here. So this one is a different lecture that I'm working on. Uh, so up here up, we have at the top we have the what's called the YAML. It's just the basic document inf in information and I got a code chunk. So this is going to run some code in my document. Uh, I've got a section here which is just uh, marked off with uh, two hashtags. Got some bullet points for these slides, um, and then uh, maybe I'll have uh, code chunking. So the code chunks are set off with three little back ticks, uh, and then a letting you know what language it is, and I can set some options in there as well. I can tell it whether to um, show the code itself and to run the code itself. Right? I can switch those off. I just want to show the code. I can hit, turn um, echo equals on to show the code, and eval equals false to not run the code. Or maybe I just want to run the code and not show the code. Echo equals false. Eval equals true. Maybe I want to do both. Maybe I want to do neither. I don't know why you'd want to do neither. Um, but inside it, I can have a bunch of code, whatever code I want, and then it will. When I when I do uh, when I'm done, all I do is I go up here and I click the knit button, and it will build this document for me and spit out an HTML file, which I can save somewhere, upload somewhere, put on our pubs, uh, or a PDF perhaps, uh, or a Word document, also an option, or slides, or whatever it is. It's just a good way to handle things. Uh, uh, especially if there's code involved. All right, I think that is just about it. It has been long enough. Uh, I hope that you've gotten something out of this, uh, and I hope that this is going to help you in your transition to uh, using R in teaching econometrics. Thank you very much.